Hi, ich bin's, der Silly Hu und ich bin wieder da. Und am Ende der letzten Folge, wo ich die Aufnahme ausgemacht habe äh, und vom Server gegangen bin, habe ich hier Lava gehört. Deswegen dachte ich mir, ich grabe hier ein bisschen rum, bevor die Dias äh, in die Lava fallen. Äh, und ich habe tatsächlich nicht falsch gehört, aber die scheinen da nicht dran zu liegen. Das passt also. Okay, ähm, ja, heute habe ich, was heißt heute, also die letzte Folge ist, oh, ist es ein Skelett-Spawner? Oh mein Gott, wie geil ist das denn? Oh mein Gott, ich habe in meinem ganzen Leben immer nur äh, so Crap gefunden wie ähm, Dingens, ne? Zombie-Spawner ohne Ende, was der größte Crap ist. Ich kann mich nicht erinnern, jemals ein Skelett-Spawner gefunden zu haben. Richtig geil. Äh, ich bin natürlich noch auf der Suche nach einem Creeper-Spawner für äh, Raketen und so. Man weiß Bescheid für Lightra-Zeug. Ähm, ja, das ist auf jeden Fall ein cooler Fund. Aber darum geht es jetzt auch gar nicht. Denn heute pumpen wir, also nicht heute, die letzte Aufnahme ist wie gesagt... Äh, wie lange her? Keine Ahnung. Vielleicht ein paar Stunden. Ähm, einen ganz besonderen Talk. Und zwar von Christopher Domas. Äh, falls ihn jemand kennt. Ähm, keine Ahnung, ich würde mal sagen, unter den DEFCON-Speakern einer der berühmteren, würde ich jetzt mal so äh, in den Raum stellen. Ist natürlich keine leichte Kost, was der immer rausschallert, aber auf jeden Fall höchst interessant. Ähm, Genau, deswegen dachte ich, äh, können wir uns das heute mal reinpressen. Und zwar, DEFCON 26, God Mode Unlocked Hardware Backdoors in Redacted, Redacted, I don't know, äh, x86 von, wie gesagt, Christopher Thomas. Äh, also, let's get it started. You want to join this conference? Also, das ist Christopher Thomas, falls ihr ihn yeah. kennt. Der Dude ohne Haare. So, Christopher Domas, he's uh, going to do his talk. Domas, um, he's I don't know, wie man den spricht. Wie immer Leute. He's kind of asked that if you can. Kein Plan, wie man die Leute ausspricht. Ja. Hier, damit ihr es nochmal seht, uh, auf GitHub, XOR, uh, EAX, EAX, EAX. Ne? Oder Twitter oder was auch immer. Aber ich glaube auf jeden Fall auf GitHub ist das sein Handle. Niemand verwendet Twitter anyways. So, let's go. To do it after the talk. So, with that, go ahead, Chris. Das ist natürlich auch sau krass für die Felder und so. Like any good presentation, I think we've got to start off with a disclaimer. Uh, basically, all of this research was done on my own. This does not reflect the opinion of my current employer or any previous employers. Uh, but with that, my name is Christopher Gilmas. I'm a cybersecurity researcher. I think we're, uh, I think we're a lot of different things in the past, but uh, recently, the last few years, what I've sort of been focused on is the idea of low-level processor exploitation. It turns out there's a lot of fun things we can do with that. So in order to frame the discussion for the rest of the day, I want to start off with a demo of exactly what we're going to be talking about. So what we have here is, let me pause that. Uh, what we have here, um, I'm walking through the system as a regular unprivileged user. I'm going to open up a very simple C file. All it does is it loads uh, some values into the EAX register, and then it executes all of these bound instructions. Now, if you're not familiar with the basic bound instruction, it is a pretty simple instruction. All it does is it takes two arguments, and it checks if you're... I glaube, ich kenne den Talk. Ich bin mir aber nicht sicher. Aber Christopher Domas kann man sich auch so oft anschauen, wie man will. Ne? Also, da, gerade wenn man nebenbei Minecraft spielt, äh, keine Chance, ne? Äh, hier, für, damit ihr die Instructions seht. Oh mein Gott, ist der, ist da ein Zombie irgendwo? Ah, die sind über mir. Okay. Ähm, ja, hier habt ihr gesehen. Alles klar. First argument is within the bounds provided by the second argument. Now, if you look carefully at these bound instructions, what you'll see is that they use some kind of weird values. Basically, it looks like random values on the right. 
What that means is that these instructions don't actually even have access to the memory that they're trying to use. Now, in x86, when you don't have access to the memory that you're trying to use, you get a general protection exception. So every single one of these uh, bound instructions is going to throw one of these general protection exceptions. And in Linux, you see that as a sig fault. Uh, despite knowing that that's what's going to happen, at the end of this program, we are going to try to execute a uh, shell. So we'll exit out of here, and we will uh, run this um, program, we'll compile it, uh, launch it, and exactly what we expect to happen will happen. We'll get a segmentation call, because those bound instructions don't have access to the memory that they're trying to use, and I'm still the exact same user I was before, still logged in as Delta. But if I make one tiny change to this program, um, I'm gonna add one x86 instruction. It's an instruction that's so obscure and unheard of, it doesn't actually have a mnemonic associated with it. Um, it is going to be written in raw machine code, OF3F. And what this instruction is going to do is it is going to fundamentally change the nature of all the subsequent bound instructions, so that now, instead of their original functionality, instead of checking whether or not one value is within the bound of another, they actually want to reach into kernel memory and modify the system itself. So I'll compile this and re-execute it, and all of a sudden, we'll see I am now approved. Yeah, I thought it can be. Yeah, with the ring model, yeah, yeah, egal. Kann man sich, kann man sich so, ja noch mal anschauen, ne? So in the beginning of x86, about 30 years ago, there's no concept of separation of privileges. All the code running on the processor executed with the exact same privileges as all the other code running on the processor, and it was basically chaos. But then we added the idea of rings of privilege to the processor in order to separate out permissions. And the idea of rings of privilege was that uh, at the lowest level, we would have ring zero. And that would be the most privileged realm on the processor, where the kernel would, that the only really trusted code would execute in ring zero, and it would have complete access to the hardware. A little less privilege than that with ring one, less than that with ring two, and then way out here in the outermost ring is ring three. That's where the user code lives. Basically, all the code that we don't trust um, have access to the hardware and affect you way out here. So uh, this was the fundamental idea behind privileges on x86, where ring three, if they wanted to do anything interesting, they would have to go through very specific, carefully checked hardware privilege access mechanisms in order to ask ring zero to do something for it. And all of our other security on x86 is all based off of this fundamental premise of separation of rings. And things got kind of interesting. People started digging deeper. We found out uh, we needed things more privileged than ring zero, like the hypervisor had that more access than the kernel normally would. So we kind of called that ring minus one. Um, we found out some things have to be more privileged than that system management mode we called ring minus two. A couple years ago, some researchers found another core uh, off the x86 core um, that they called ring minus three because it could do things that the x86 core couldn't do. So things were, uh, were interesting, but if you've been following any of this research, sort of in the back of everyone's mind, this question, can, can we go further? Are there, are there even more layers to this, um, to this puzzle? So uh, I started setting out to sort of explore that idea, and uh, a lot of times when I'm starting out on new research, I find an interesting place to begin is with patents. Sometimes you can find some really interesting information that people don't document in public uh, uh, information, but you might be able to find some, some bits of useful ideas inside of patents. So uh, keeping this whole idea of this ring model of privilege yeah, in mind, and I thought this sort of nonchalantly... I think it's clicked a bit in the um, patterns, but... Actually, actually, some of the internal control registers can enable the user to bypass security mechanisms, for example, allowing ring zero access at ring three. That's a little alarming from a security perspective. You're telling me, like, we've had 30 years of relying on rings to provide our privileges on x86, and there's just some way to circumvent all of this? So they go on to say, in addition, these control registers might reveal information that the processor designers wish to keep proprietary. And for those reasons, the various x 86 processor manufacturers have not publicly documented any description of the address or function of some of these control MSRs. So this, this was really interesting. I was really, really excited about this. I wanted to run with this idea. So like any rational person, I went out and bought 57 computers to start doing some basic research on. So I had a... Uh, based on the patent time and the patent owner, I had some some idea of what processor I might specifically want to focus on for this uh, this research. But patents are kind of a funny thing. Um, IP gets bought and sold by different companies. Ideas trickle through the in industry. Um, so I sort of wanted to cast a wide net and look at a bunch of different systems for this research. But what I eventually settled on uh, was the DSC3 processor. So these are interesting processors, sort of targeted at the embedded low power market. You can find these often in point of sale systems, kiosks, ATMs, gaming. Since we're in Vegas, you might want to start poking around um, digital signage. Healthcare, digital media, uh, industrial automation, and they're in PCs and laptops as well. So um, I put off my shelf this specific system eventually. Uh, it's a pin client running a C3 Nehemiah core. And this is what we're going to look at for the rest of the presentation. At the very end of the presentation, I'll look a little bit more at what other um, processors might be affected by this issue, but this is sort of the target of this specific research. So I wasn't able to find a developer manual for this processor. So um, when we're sort of left in the dark, uh, a good place to go is sort of follow a trail of patent breadcrumbs, see what information we can derive from patents and see if there's anything useful in there that can give us hints as to how we should move our research forward. So, um, so I had to dive through a lot of patent literature, and I wanted to give a little bit of a glance into what that's like. So uh, this is actually a quote from the patent that I ended up, uh, or the patents that I ended up using, but it is something I've come across during this, this research. So uh, this, this quote says, 
Um, figure 3 shows an embodiment of a cache memory. Referring to figure 3 in one embodiment, cache memory 320 is a multi-way cache memory. In one embodiment, cache memory 320 comprises multiple physical sections. In one embodiment, cache memory 320 is logically divided into multiple sections. In one embodiment, cache memory 320 includes four cache ways, i.e. cache way 310, cache way 311, cache way 312, and cache way 314. In one embodiment, a processor sequesters one or more cache ways to store yeah. or execute processor code. Like, my head is exploding when I read stuff like this. It's so, so convoluted and so um, wrapped up in legalese, it's, it's hard to understand what the heck we're even reading. And just to uh, put that into perspective, this one four-page patent contained the phrase in one embodiment. Yeah, ja nicht nur bei Patenten so. Ich finde so allein die normale x86 Architektur Dings, wie heißt denn das Manual, richtig confusing. Was a risk architecture, and the patents didn't have a consistent terminology for this, but I just sort of started calling this the deeply embedded core of the deck on these, uh, on these processors. They also talked about something that they call the global configuration register. It's basically a register that gets exposed to the x86 core through a model specific register. And they say that this global configuration register can, act, or can activate the risk core. They also talked about an x86 launch instruction. It was basically a new instruction that they added to the um, x86 ISA, where um, once the risk core is activated, you can start a risk instruction sequence through the launch instruction, according to the patents. So um, kind of putting all these ideas together, what it, what it looked like is if our assumptions about what this deeply embedded core can do are correct, you could essentially use this as a sort of backdoor, uh, a means of surreptitiously circumventing all of the processor security checks. So that's absolutely ideal, worth exploring more for security purposes. So um, there are sort of three patents that give us some initial ideas on, on how the overall mechanisms might work. So one patent tells us that a model-specific register can be used to circumvent processor security checks. Another patent tells us that a model-specific register can be used to activate a new x86 instruction. And another patent tells us a launch instruction can be used to switch to a risk instruction sequence. So if we sort of put those three things together and try to fill in the gaps, we end up with a sequence that looks something like this. Um, we have to find a model-specific register bit that when toggled will activate a new x86 instruction that didn't previously exist and running that instruction will activate a risk core on the processor, and that core should be able to bypass the processor's security protections. So, um, so where do we begin? Well, let's look at the very first step in that chain, these model-specific registers. So if you're not familiar with the NSR, there are basically 64 bit control registers used for a wide, wide variety of things. Um, there's for debugging, performance monitoring, cache configuration, feature configuration, basically anything that doesn't have to do with general computing can be tossed into the NSRs. And unlike the x86 registers you might be more familiar with, um, they aren't accessed by name, they're accessed by address. So instead of EAX and EDX, we have addresses from 0 to 4 billion is how we access our MSRs. So basically, you load up an address into the ECX register and then execute the read MSR or write MSR instruction in order to access an MSR. Now, there's some saving grace here. Um, we think that maybe we can use this to circumvent the ring protections on the processor, but these MSRs are only um, accessible to begin with with ring 0 code. So maybe the rest of the stuff we can do from ring 3, but in order to activate that bit to begin with, we need ring 0 execution. So, um, so that's, that's good news. Although maybe, maybe we don't need ring 0 execution. I'm going to revisit this idea later in the talk, but so that we can move the uh, research forward. Let's assume for now that we have one time ring 0 access on that processor just to enable this backdoor feature. Um, and, and we'll revisit that uh, concept later. So, so let's look at these model specific registers some more. Well, the patent basically comes right out and tells us that the various x86 processor manufacturers have not publicly documented any description of the address or function of some of the control MSRs. So that's a, a challenge for us. Um, I, I think there's a bit in one of these MSRs that might activate something cool, but it's probably not going to be documented. So step one, um, in order to, to try to explore this idea, is just figure out which MSRs are actually um, implemented by the processor, regardless of what the documentation says, which MSRs are actually there. So this one's pretty easy to solve. Um, basically, you can set the general purpose uh, exception handler on the processor to point to some handler under, under your control. Um, you can do that with the LIDP instruction. Uh, then you can load up an MSR address that you want to check. Let's say you want to figure out, does MSR number 1337 exist on that processor? Well, load that number into the ECF register, and then execute the uh, read MSR instruction. Now, if you don't get a fault from that read MSR instruction, you know that that MSR exists. If you do get a fault, if your handler takes control, you know that that MSR doesn't exist. So this is a really easy way to figure out exactly which MSR actually exists on your processor, regardless of what documentation says. So when you do this on the BSC3, um, you end up with an alarming number of MSRs, way more than would normally be on an X86 processor. We found 1,300 implemented MSRs on that processor, which is far too many to analyze. I think one of these is going to activate a new X86 instruction that's too many to go through by hand. So step two is sort of figuring out which MSRs here are actually interesting. Which ones should I be exploring for uh, this research? So I, I came up with this idea of sort of a timing side channel attack against the MSRs, uh, where basically what I would do is I would calculate how long it took to access each of the 4 billion possible MSRs. And what that looks like is you've got this read MSR instruction, 
And then on, uh, on either side of that, you've got a serialized read time and counter instruction. That lets you see exactly how long it took you to read MSR to execute, and that shows you how long it took to access the, uh, the MSR. So if you run this code with something like this, where on the X axis I've got the MSR numbers, and on the Y axis I've got the access time for that MSR. Green is MSRs that are implemented on the processor, red is MSRs that are not implemented on the processor. So this, this side channel attack actually gives you some really, really interesting insights into how the processor works under the hood that we normally would never have access to. But what we can do with this then is sort of form a hypothesis. Um, I'm going to theorize that this global configuration register, this really powerful register that the patents talk about, um, is probably unique. There's probably not several similar versions of this register um, within the MSRs. There's probably exactly one of these uh, on that processor. So what I can start to do is I can start to look for MSRs with unique access times, so um, like these that are circled in uh, red. And when we actually start to do that, what we find is that there's relatively few MSRs that are truly unique on this processor. In fact, out of the 1,300 MSRs that are there, um, we identified 43 that actually seem um, interesting and worth exploring more. So that's, that's good. It seems like we're making progress. I sort of whittled down the number of MSRs from initially 4 billion down to 43 to actually explore this research. Um, but it's still a lot to tackle by hand. That's 2752 bits worth of MSRs to, uh, to check. Now, my theory is that one of these bits is going to activate a new S86 instruction. So I want to figure out, um, when I toggle these bits, did a new instruction appear on the architecture? Um, well, X86 is a really, really complicated instruction set, and it's sort of hard to estimate how many instructions could actually be in X86, but a rough upper bounds would be somewhere on the order of 1.3 undecillion possible instructions. So I want to figure out, do one of these MSR bits create a new instruction? But I've got to search through 1.3 undecillion instructions in order to find that new instruction, if it appeared at all. So um, even taking a really optimistic estimate, if we just scan through a billion possible x86 instructions every second, you can do some quick Fermi uh, calculations in order to see 1.3 undecillion divided by 1 billion divided by 60 seconds a minute divided by 60 minutes an hour divided by 24 hours a day divided by 365 days a year means it's going to take about an eternity to scan that entire instruction set. So, um, so that's, that's not reasonable. I'm making things worse. That's, that's for one scan. We have to scan each of these 2752 bits. That's about 2752 eternities in order to find which bit creates a new instruction. So fortunately, um, there's a better solution. I actually uh, released this tool last year called ScanSifter, which was, was kind of neat. It found a, a smart way of searching through the x86 instruction set using uh, page fault analysis and depth per search algorithm in order to scan all of x86 for the most probable instructions in about a day. And it can be used to find things like undocumented instructions or new instructions up here, but it still can't be run 2752 times if it takes a day to scan a single bit. So what we can do instead is we can try to toggle each of those 2,752 candidate MSR bits one by one. Um, but these are configuration bits. These control the inner workings of the processor, and I have no idea what these bits actually do. So a lot of them are going to lock the processor, or freeze it, or panic the kernel, or reset the system entirely. So trying to toggle 2,000 some bits one by one uh, can't be a manual process. We need some sort of automation in order to make this work. So the system I came up with looks something like this, where uh, we would have a target um, that has a C3 processor uh, hooked up to a relay, basically a uh, wire would be soldered onto the power switch on the target, and then that's hooked up to a relay. The relay is hooked up to a master system, so the master can power cycle the target through the relay. Um, the target also network boots uh, through a switch from the master, and the master Oder ich can keine the target. What the master can tell the target is, uh, toggle this MSR bit, and the master's going to check, did something become unstable, did the system stop responding, did the kernel panic? Uh, if not, it's going to try to toggle the next MSR bit. If so, it's going to power cycle the target. This way the master can sort of repeatedly go through and identify exactly which of those 2752 MSR bits can be activated without the target becoming unstable. So uh, over the course of about a week, through hundreds of automated reboots, we're able to identify exactly which bits we can actually turn on uh, on that processor. So um, after that, what we do is we try to turn on all the bits that we possibly can, get all of those bits on at once, and only then do we actually run ScanSifter. Only then do we scan the processor for new instructions. So that looks um, something like this using uh, ScanSifter for this purpose. So uh, like I said, ScanSifter uses uh, page fault analysis and depth first search in order to uh, search through the x86 ISA. Um, we're watching ScanSifter sort of in the middle of a scan, probably about uh, 12 or 15 hours into a scan. And what you can see it doing is generating machine code in order to try to search through the feasible x86 instructions uh, on this processor. And if you let ScanSifter run for uh, long enough, eventually it will spit out um, something new um, in that lower window there. Since if you're, uh, after about a day, it finds exactly one new instruction on that architecture, um, OF3F. So this must be the launch instruction that the patents are talking about, the new instruction that got activated by these MSR bits. So through GDB and some trial and error, I was able to figure out the launch instruction. It's basically a jump EAS uh, instruction. So um, from that, we can figure out what the global configuration register is. Now, I activated all of these possible MSR bits in order to find the launch instruction. Now I'm curious which bit was really responsible for activating that launch instruction. Um, fortunately, now that I've identified the OF3F instruction, I no longer need to run ScanSifter um, for additional scans. What I can do is activate each of those MSR bits one by one. And after activating one, I'll try to execute the launch instruction. If it doesn't work, then that was the wrong bit. If suddenly the launch instruction appeared on the architecture, then that means I found the bit that activated the launch instruction. 
Um, so using that approach, we're able to find out that NSR number 1107 actually was the MSR that enabled the launch instruction. And specifically, it was bit zero inside of MSR 1107. Now, I suspect that this is going to open the door for uh, another uh, architecture on the processor, which will let me bypass those ring protections once and for all and circumvent all the processor security checks. So because of how much power that single bit has just potentially enabled, I started calling bit zero of MSR 1107 the God mode bit. So um, at this point, we've, we've figured out the God mode bit, we've figured out this, this um, hidden launch instruction in the FA6 ISA. The, the next question then is, how do I actually execute instructions on this SA6 or on this, uh, on this new risk core that we've enabled? So we start diving the patents to try to figure this out. And patents sort of uh, hints at this idea that instructions are fetched out of memory and then um, passed to different decoders depending on whether you're in x86 or risk mode. And I had to go through a lot of trial and error to figure out exactly what that might look like under the hood. But this is sort of what I ended up with. Um, essentially, uh, uh, an instruction will be fetched out of the instruction cache. And it would be passed to some sort of pre x86 uh, decoder. And that decoder is going to break apart um, the components of an x86 instruction. And then those components are going to get passed to a check. And that check is going to um, determine, am I in risk mode or not? Namely, has that launch instruction just been executed? If the answer is no, then those components are all passed on to a further x86 decoder and the instruction executes as x86. If the answer is yes, one of the components of that instruction, 32-bit uh, constant value, will be torn out and passed over to the risk decoder in order to execute the risk instruction. So um, basically, with this setup, there needs to be some x86 instruction where if the processor is in risk mode, it can pass a portion of itself over to the risk processor uh, on this chip. And since this instruction, whatever it is, sort of joins the x86 and risk cores, I called it a bridge instruction. Uh, basically, give me a way to feed instructions over to the risk core. So the next question now is how do we find this yeah, um, um, x86 bridge instruction that will let me have the risk instructions? Um, not easy, but it should be sufficient just to detect that a risk instruction has been executed. So um, how, how, how can we detect if a risk instruction has been executed, given that I have no idea what these instructions can actually do or what their execution will look like? Um, well, well, an easy way would be, um, if our theory is right, if this risk core really can circumvent processor security checks, then there should be some risk instruction. I don't know what that's some risk instruction. Yeah, when the steht 100 percent Yeah, sag jetzt nicht, dass mein Akku kaputt ist. like a processor lock or a kernel panic or a system reset. Um, basically, if I observe any of those behaviors, that means I've executed one of these mysterious risk instructions because none of those things should ever happen executing ring 3 x 6 instructions normally. So um, I sort of tore apart the scene sifter in order to help me with this. I ripped out the core scene sifter, changed it to run in a brute force mode. Um, so it's still executing x 6 instructions, but before each x 6 instruction that it generates, it's going to execute the launch instruction in order, in order to switch to risk mode. And what it's trying to find is some x 6 instruction that corrupted the system. And that's actually what we just saw here. We saw the processor lock when the uh, scene sifter hit exactly the right combination of x86 and risk instruction. So once we observe that processor lock, that means that we found this bridge instruction, this x86 instruction that can execute risk instruction. So it takes about an hour of fuzzing to get here. We just uh, saw a short snippet. But it turns out that this bound EAS instruction is this bridge instruction. It's what's going to let me feed instructions over to the risk core. And specifically, this 32-bit constant value used in the bound instruction appears to be the risk instruction that can execute, execute on the deeply embedded core. And that's a pretty easy thing to check. Basically, uh, I can see that for some specific 32-bit values, the processor locks every single time. And for other 32-bit values, nothing seems to happen very, very consistently. So, so now we found a bridge instruction. I know how to send instructions over to that deeply embedded core. So the next question is, what do we want to execute on this, on this alternate um, instruction set? Uh, what do these instructions even look like? What architecture am I even dealing with? So um, ideally, moving forward, I would just assume that this, this other architecture is probably some known common architecture. It's probably something like ARM or PowerPC or MIPS. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to invent an architecture from scratch. So we can assume that this other architecture is some common architecture, and I could try to execute a common architecture of instructions on this uh, on this other core. So for example, if I thought maybe I'm dealing with ARM, I might try to execute um, an add one to R0 um, instruction. The problem, um, or what I encountered, was that for some of these very, very simple risk instructions I was generating, the processor would lock. So if I generate an instruction like, um, like add one to R0, and I try to execute that on this risk core, and the processor locks, that probably means I'm not dealing with the architecture I thought I was dealing with. I'm probably not dealing with ARM if that instruction, uh, that simple instruction will everything up. So I was actually able to rule out certain different common architectures this way. And I still think most likely this other architecture, this risk core that we're dealing with, is probably uh, derived from some common architecture, but it seemed like it was maybe modified enough that I couldn't identify it. So that's an important thing to move forward, um, just assuming uh, the same with the black box, um, basically treating it as some totally unknown architecture that we've never seen before. Um, and that means that we have to reverse engineer the format. Of, of these instructions for this deeply embedded core. And I spent uh, probably the bulk of this research actually trying to reverse engineer the format of these instructions. And so I started calling those the deeply embedded instruction set of the dice. 
So the question is, how do we begin reverse engineering a totally unknown instruction set? Ideally, what I would do is I would execute one of these risk instructions and observe its results. The challenge though, is I have absolutely no knowledge of this instruction set architecture that I'm dealing with, um, and I probably can't observe the results on the risk course. So for example, if I did generate an instruction, like add one to R0, but I can uh, only view R0, I can, uh, the question is then, how do I view R0 from my SA6 core? How do I even detect that I've made any changes uh, to the risk course? Fortunately, uh, there's, there is an approach for this. The patents actually suggest that these two cores share a uh, register file, at least partially share a register file, which means I may not be able to view all the um, effects of my risk instruction, but I should be able to use some of the effects of the risk instruction from the SA6 core. So, so for example, the patents show an example where an ARM and the SA6 core share some of their registers. So that means from the SA6 core, I can actually see some of the effects of these instructions. So what this would look like then? is I can generate an initial state for the processor. I'm going to generate a bunch of values for the processor register, maybe random values, maybe set all those registers to be pointers to various buffers. I'm going to record that information. I'm going to generate some buffers in user -like memory and in kernel memory. I'm going to record those buffers, basically record all the information I can about the system state. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute that launch instruction, that OF3F uh, instruction, in order to toggle the risk core. After that, I'll execute the uh, bridge instruction, the bound EAS instruction. That lets me send a risk instruction over the risk core. And I'm going to generate an arbitrary risk instruction to try out. After that instruction ex executes, um, I'll record the results of the system state. I'll record all the registers, all the buffers, and everything else. And what I want to see is, did something change on the system? Did that input state and output state differ uh, in any way? Um, unfortunately, we run into even more challenges here. I'm dealing with a totally unknown instruction set that probably has unfettered access to ring zero. So it is really, really easy to accidentally generate instructions that cause kernel panics or processor loss or a complete system reboots. Um, and in practice, I could only generate about 20 risk instructions before the system became unrecoverably corrupted, before I had to reboot the system and start over. So even after optimization, it took about two minutes for one of these systems to boot. So some more rough approximations kind of indicate that it was going to take months and months of buzzing in order to gather enough data in order to reverse engineer this instruction set. So I stated my initial setup. Instead of buzzing one target system, I bought as many systems as I could on eBay, turned out to be seven of these thin clients, and I hooked them all up. And if you look carefully at this, what you'll see is each of these systems has a little green wire coming out of the chassis. That wire is soldered onto the system system's power switch, all of those wires go to a relay module. That relay module is hooked up to a master system or USB. All of these systems boot over the network from the master system. So the master system can boot up these systems, um, can SSH into them, and can assign each of them fuzzing tasks for this risk architecture. It can then record all the results of that, those, uh, those fuzzing tasks for offline analysis. And when it detects that one of these systems has become corrupted, when it stops responding, or the kernel panics, the master can use those relays in order to uh, reboot the target. So we can actually see uh, an example of this in action. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the master to start uh, start a fuzzing task. It's going to think for a little bit as it generates um, as it generates some tasks for the, the targets, and then if you listen to the relay. You can hear each relay clicking on. You can see the relay lights, and if you look closely at those target systems, you can see the green LEDs on them coming on one by one as each of those systems boots up. Um, so I think for brevity's sake, I'm, uh, I'm going to cut this video a little bit short, but if you'd like to see the uh, full demo afterward, um, you can grab me. But in about a minute, when these systems uh, come online, we'll be able to see the target start tasking them with uh, buzzing jobs, and we'll be able to see logs coming into the target, and eventually the target will detect that some of these systems have frozen, and it will bring them offline through the relay so that this process can continue. Uh, so this was, this was slow fuzzing work. Um, it's fairly laborious. Um, I let the system run for about three weeks. I collected 30, or, uh, 15 gigabytes of logs across 2.3 million different state disks, for about 4,000 total hours of compute time. Um, but it's really exciting after I had the final results. We can start sifting through these logs in order to try to find something interesting. So I'm curious, can I actually do anything um, to ring zero from ring three according to these logs? And it turns out we can. We can pretty quickly start to find some things that uh, shouldn't exist in the secure world. So for example, the instruction A7719563, uh, if you look at that EDX register, um, I was able to read control register zero into the EDX register. Uh, control register zero is supposed to only be accessible by ring zero, but we just read it from ring three using one of these risk instructions. And we're not limited to reading ring zero data. Um, if we look here, instruction 8AD4 was actually able to write debug register zero. You'll see that the EDP register got written to DR zero. DR zero should only be accessible to ring zero. We're circumventing the ring protections through this risk core. So at this point, um, it's kind of time to start thinking about payload. What should actually be having the, uh, this risk core do for us? And really, once you can reach through the ring boundaries, the sky's going to be whatever you want. But I thought it'd be useful to have some sort of easy to demonstrate payload. So I thought a good demonstration would simply be um, elevating the current process to root permission. So um, that would look something like uh, grabbing a structure called the global descriptor table, parsing out a field on the GDT um, called the uh, FS segment. That FS register can actually point you to a structure in kernel memory called the task structure. And if you grab a certain field from the task structure, you can get a pointer to what's called the cred structure. And 
from there, you can actually set yourself to have group permissions as long as you can reach directly into kernel memory and grab and modify all of this information. Now, there's really only a few pieces here. There's parts highlighted in red that require us to cross ring boundaries. Things like addition and bit manipulation, we can technically do that on the S86 core. We don't need this risk core to do that for us, but it was kind of fun um, having this, this um, unknown core execute instructions. Uh, so I thought it would be a little bit more impactful if I wrote this entire payload for the deeply embedded core and never used x86. So I've got 15 gigabytes of logs. Um, I want to try to build this payload. So it's time to start sifting through those logs, trying to find some primitives to use. And this sort of feels like building a rock chain. Um, you've got this, you've got these like tiny little pieces of functionality. You have an overall idea of what you're trying to accomplish, and you're trying to figure out how to piece together those little pieces in order to form your, your final payload. So, um, so we can start finding those little pieces that we need. So for example, uh, 8331 or uh, A313 uh, was an instruction that was able to read the global descriptor table. That's the first piece of our payload. Um, I'm able to find a kernel read instruction inside of those logs. D407, uh, it looks the low byte of EDP got read out of the kernel memory buffer. Um, I can actually modify kernel memory. Uh, E2V7 was able to write a single byte into kernel memory. Now, this is really promising. If I can write a byte into kernel memory, it means I can do precision exploitation through the deeply embedded core. But um, at the end, I sort of decided, you know, sifting through logs like this by hand just doesn't scale. I want to be able to write more robust payloads for this deeply embedded core. So I want to some sort of automated approach uh, for, for doing this. So uh, what I wanted was some way to extract behavior patterns from these state diffs in order to identify the bit patterns inside of these instructions. So I built a tool called the collector. Um, so the collector basically helped us do automated reverse engineering of completely unknown instruction sets. So the way the um, collector worked is it would basically look at those state diffs recorded by the fuzzer, and it would try to um, identify um, some basic operations, like loading the media values into registers, like um, transferring one register uh, to another. Uh, there we go. Um, like reading memory, like modifying memory, uh, like uh, shifting registers, um, any number of arithmetic and bitwise instructions. Uh, the, the collector would try to identify those just by looking at differences in the input state and the output state between risk instructions. Uh, and then what it would do is it would bin instructions based on what that's it saw those instructions having. So it might spit out, well, here's a bin of instructions that all exhibit this property of transferring one register to another. And after it had these instructions in, what it would look for is patterns within the bins. So for example, one of the first things we might want to figure out is how are the register values for each of these instructions encoded inside of the instruction? For example, where is EAX encoded in this instruction? So it would look for each of these instructions, which bits might represent EAX, which might represent EDX. So that's what I have highlighted in purple. Basically, for each individual instruction, which bits might be encoding the registers that the collector saw being used by that instruction. So then what the collector does is it tries to identify patterns across the entire bin. So we can see then that these two middle columns are the only consistent piece of this pattern. In other words, these two middle columns must be the thing that uh, records or encodes the input and output registers for these instructions. So we do that for all sorts of uh, different facets of an instruction encoding. We can try to figure out which bits are used to encode the opcode of the instruction. And it's not a perfect process. Ideally, we would see totally consistent patterns across the entire bin. That's not what we see here. Um, but what the collector will do will be it will try to uh, pick the things that are most common. In other words, in this situation, they'll say, well, these are the most likely bits that encode your opcodes. So you can try to find things like don't care bits in the instructions or bits that seem to follow some sort of uh, statistical patterns, um, but we can't necessarily tell uh, what they are. And then it'll match all this information together in order to sort of automatically derive the bit encoding of each um, possible instruction on this uh, on this deeply embedded core. So if we're looking at the bins that it creates and what sort of functionality we might want to get out of the deeply embedded instruction set, these are sort of the encodings that it came up to, uh, came up with for a variety of different instructions. So we've got instructions to move registers around and load the global descriptor table. Um, basically we have a primitive assembly language now uh, so that we can write payloads for this for this deeply embedded core. So um, so we could now we now we know the instruction coding. We could write some payloads by hand if we wanted, but I thought it would be cooler if I wrote an actual assembler for these things so that I could, I could uh, write some of these uh, programs at a, at a higher level. Um, so, uh, so basically I wrote this dice assembler, a custom assembler just for this unknown instruction set that will assemble these different primitives into uh, their raw binary representation and then wrap them in one of these executive six bridge instructions so that the dice instruction can be sent over to the deeply embedded core for execution. Um, so now we're ready to revisit that uh, payload idea that we had. We can use the LGD instruction in order to read out the global descriptor table. We can use some of our other dice instructions in order to uh, parse that uh, descriptor field in order to grab a pointer to the task structure, in order to grab a pointer to the cred structure, in order to write to the cred structure, circumventing the ring protections, modifying kernel memory in order to give ourselves uh, root level access uh, on the system, all using nothing but instructions specifically for this, uh, this unknown architecture embedded alongside our x86 core.
So um, the output of this, if you run it through the assembler, looks uh, something like this. Um, basically, we will activate that deeply embedded core with a launch instruction that's on the left. Then we execute all these bound instructions. Each bound instruction sends a single instruction over to the deeply embedded core for execution by the risk processor. Um, these instructions are going to circumvent the processor security mechanisms in order to grant the current process root permissions, and then we launch a shell. So let's revisit that demonstration from the, uh, the beginning, and I'll walk through that in a little bit more depth. So here we have our complete payload doing uh, the, the steps that we just talked about. Um, we load the address of the payload into the EAS register, and then we execute this launch instruction uh, on the T3 processor. After that, we got our actual payload, um, all of the bound instructions, the F86 instructions that are able to communicate with uh, the risk core. Each bound instruction sends a single uh, risk instruction over to the deeply embedded core. Uh, and at the very end of, of this sequence, we uh, launch a shell in order to hopefully gain the permission. So if we uh, exit out of here and run this program, we'll compile it first. They'll double check exactly who we are again. So we are just a regular unprivileged user, but when we run the program, um, we use that deeply embedded core in order to gain root permissions. So this thing. So, um, so I want to toss this out here, only sort of tongue in cheek. Um, we just to sort of explore down to what we were calling ring minus three, but I want to pitch this as sort of a ring minus four. It is in some ways more powerful than our previously known ring minus three. It is a core sort of co-located with the x86 core. It has unrestricted access to the x86 core's register file, unlike ring minus three. And unlike ring minus three, it shares a lot of the execution pipeline with the x86 core, which gives it sort of more power than ring minus three. But at the same time, the whole thing's just nebulous. When we're this deep, the whole ring model is completely broken down, and this is sort of nonsensical anymore. But the, the point is, um, we've now um, got direct ring three to ring zero hardware privilege escalation on x86. That has never actually been accomplished before. Everything else where we've come close has had to rely on code in the operating system or other bugs to, uh, to sort of work as a launching point. This is a purely hardware approach for accomplishing this. So the, the, the good news is that fortunately we need initial ring zero access. Everything else in the payload happens in ring three, but we have to activate um, that back door using one-time ring zero access to septic hot mode fits, um, at least in theory. Uh, but I want to poke around with this a little bit more. So here we're looking at a different system. Um, this is another system I have sitting on my on my shelf here. So this is a DSC3 processor, but it's a Samuel 2 core instead of the NetMI core that I was using. What we just saw is a system cleanly boot. Um, it's a freshly booted operating system, totally unmodified. I'm going to log in as a regular unprivileged user um, for the fastest processors. But once we get to a uh, prompt, what I'm going to do is insert uh, the MSR kernel module um, in order to gain access to the MSRs. So you notice I'm pseudo here, but I'm not writing anything. I'm only using this to read things out to show you. I don't have the read MSR tool installed on here. We're going to just use the hexcom tool in order to dump out that global configuration register, MSR number 1107. So the low bit of that register was the god mode bit. If you look at that low byte, what you see is 11010111. The low bit there, the god mode bit, is on by default when the system boots. That means on the CML2 core, um, any unprivileged code that knows what it's doing can um, escalate kernel level privileges at, at any time. And we totally break down x86 ring uh, protections and privileges like this. All of our other uh, protections fall like down those. Like antivirus does nothing when you can just reach directly into ring zero. Uh, ASLR depth don't help you anymore when you can just circumvent the ring privilege model. Post time, control flow integrity, kernel integrity checks, none of this helps once rings mean nothing. Um, but there are mitigations, none of them are great, but there are opportunities here. So one is you can update the processor microcode in order to lock down the god mode. Just don't let people set the god mode to begin with. We can update the microcode in order to disable any new code assist on the bridge instruction so that you couldn't send instructions over to that risk core. You could update the operating system in firmware in order to disable the godmode bit during boots and then periodically make sure that that bit has stayed off and nobody's um, enabled the back door. Um, but at the end of the day, the point's kind of moved. This is an older processor. It's not in widespread use. And I don't really want to throw Via under the bus here. Um, I think their target market is embedded. And I think this is probably a useful feature for their customers. It was just a very flawed implementation in some of their earlier iterations of the processor. So, um, so instead, let's take this as a case study. The reality is that backdoors do exist. This is not just conspiracy theory stuff, but they don't have to remain invisible. We do have the techniques necessary in order to find these. So um, sort of looking forward, uh, even though this is not a common processor, I do think this is a big deal. This is not just a big deal for C3. This is not just a big deal for x 86 I think this is a big problem for all of computer engineering in general, because this, this hardware that we're using to protect all of our secrets, to do all of our computation, we have no way to introspect it. So whether or not backdoors are real in a general sense um, is, is sort of irrelevant. That question is going to haunt us as long as we can't introspect 
our own hardware. So I, I hope that's what people will take out of this. I hope when you see something that seems off limits, when you see these weird hints and patents, because the patents that I saw were just the tip of the iceberg and some of this weird stuff that's out there, I hope people will dive in deep and uh, really see what's under the hood. Uh, because, because that's how security works. That's how we build trust in, uh, in these systems. So sort of uh, along those lines, I've open sourced all of the research that I use for this. All the tools, techniques, all the code and data I've demonstrated today are uh, freely available. So I hope people will use those to scan their own system. I hope people will use those to scan What the much, fuck? Much I have not clicked. What the um, heck? And along those lines, I want to quickly throw out this uh, other idea that I didn't have time to cover. Is this a microbug or is my mouse um, or uh, I, I, I Windows? I don't know if you can. Ja gut, ich lade gerade ein Video hoch und jetzt lade ich auch noch äh, ein Spiel runter gleichzeitig. Ähm, ja. Also, ich denke, das war's dann äh, mit der Episode. Checkt auf jeden Fall ähm, Christopher Domer aus auf GitHub, XOR, IAX, IAX. Der hat der hat echt coolen Der hat da echt coolen Kram. Kann ich kann ich nur empfehlen. Oh mein Gott. Ja, also das ist mir zu blöd. Genau, ähm, ja, wir sehen uns dann in der nächsten Folge ähm, wieder. Tschüssi.